Welcome everybody. This Thank is you. the Works in Progress reading and we have um, tonight we're going to have eight readers because we have one who is out sick. So we have eight readers, all of whom, including two others, have been writing every day for five weeks, working on these polished nuts that we're about to share with each other. None of us have heard each other's writing yet, so that's all, that's going to be very intriguing because we're a group, and yet we haven't um, yet we haven't heard what how the others write or what they write. Now I will also say that during the readings I will put you all on mute, and after the readings I'll unmute you um, because when someone has read it's nice to give them you know um, a little bit of applause, a little bit of commentary. In particular, if you're listening to something someone's reading and you really love a line or you really love an idea, type it into the chat because it's very hard to get the feedback that we all need that of what's good about our writing. We often hear what's clunky or you know people z zoom in on well on that second paragraph, um, but we hardly ever hear the this is amazing. I never thought of it that way or I love this turn of phrase. So pop it into the chat and when you hear something that really strikes you and is interesting. Um, somebody's sending me a message. As I said, I'm going to be a little bit clinky, clunky, but I think I'm doing it pretty much as well as CBS, so I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> it's all clunky these days, right? Okay, so um, we start tonight with Diane Irving, and Diane is way up in the corner here for me. I don't know where she is for you. Um, but she is a children's writer from Australia, and a lot of her books have to do with belonging and the idea of fitting in in your new space. And today she's reading um, Little Gus Giraffe Goes to Japan. Did I get that title right? Yes. Okay. It's a working title. Working title. But um, Diane has worked with me for a number of years, and this is her second time through the Creative Mastery class. I suppose she needed more mastery. <laughs> But I think also it's the everyday of writing that brought her in because it's, that's a consistent habit that everybody sort of appreciates laying down. So I'm going to leave it over to Diane and um, let her start her reading. I'm going to mute you all. Diane, if you speak, we can... Okay. Uh, your... yep. Am I good to go? Um... Speaker view. Am I good to go? Yes, I must be because I think um, I'm muted. So I'll get started anyway. Well, uh, you're muted. Okay. I think I'm good to go. So I am writing a children's story. Um, so it's a picture book. So you'll have to use your imagination to um, imagine some of the imagery. Um, and this is um, a recent story. So this is just an outline only. So there's quite a few plot flaws. So bear with me. <laughs> and um, the setting for the story is, um, Little Gus Giraffe um, is going on a, an, an adventure to Japan. So it starts in Africa in the Serengeti. So if you could imagine that and also imagine if you're between the ages of four and six. So Little Gus Giraffe was singing and dancing his favorite thing to do. Big Gus Giraffe poked his head out the trees and said, Hurry, little Gus Giraffe, it's time to be on our way. Big Gus Giraffe has a new job in Tokyo. They need his long neck to check the upper branches of the cherry tree blossoms to make sure there are no pests and disease. Little Gus Giraffe thought the pictures of Japan were amazing. He was so excited and kept tapping his feet. Will I like Tokyo? asked Little Gus Giraffe. Will I like the food? Will I fit in there? Some things are different and some things just the same, said Big Gus Giraffe. I know you will find your own special way. The buildings were monstrous and Little Gus Giraffe couldn't see the blue sky. 
the traffic looked like a large herd of wildebeest passing by and they sounded just the same. Honk, honk. People were rushing on the pavement and crossing the roads. Perhaps they were running in their own special way. Little Gus Giraffe found the food rather strange. The noodles were kind of a dish, a strange kind of a dish. It smelt a lot like seaweed and fish. The noodles slipped right off his tongue and Little Gus Giraffe wasn't sure he could get this eating thing done. Little Gus Giraffe and Big Gus Giraffe hopped on the subway with their necks bent so far over Stay close, little Gus Giraffe, said Big Gus Giraffe. Little Gus Giraffe blinked and blinked and couldn't believe all the heads swooping in and out like a giant swarm of bees that only just came up to the top of his knees. Big Gus Giraffe trimmed the cherry tree blossoms and little Gus Giraffe danced in the leaves. He slipped over his feet and fell with a flop and started to feel quite out of place. I don't think I have found my own special way, said little Gus Giraffe. Big Gus Giraffe said, I have an idea. Let's go to family karaoke. Little Gus Giraffe had never been to a family karaoke club. He thought the stage looked like a large acacia tree, just like the Serengeti, just like home. People sang their favorite songs and soon it was their turn. Little Gus Giraffe said to Big Gus Giraffe, let's sing Socialosa. And away they went. So Socialosa, so Socialosa. They sang and they danced across the stage. The crowd clapped their hands and tapped their feet. They all sang together, so, so, Losha, so, so, Losha. And little Gus Giraffe and big Gus Giraffe swayed their hips, tapped their feet, and everybody thought they were rather neat. They wrapped their necks together in a family hug. Some things are different, some things are the same and happy they sang in their own special way. That's it. Very nice. Yeah. like that. Yay. That was great. That was fabulous. Thank you, Thank you for that. That, that was, was really good. Just adorable. <laughs> really good. Yeah, I love the hug. The twine neck, mm -hmm. the right yeah. hug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. It came out really short. And I love the courage to sing Social Losa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the rest of you play in songs. <laughs> I could see the illustrations. Oh, how sweet. Oh, oh good. Whoever said that. Mm -hmm. that, that was Kathy? Kathy. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you, Kathy. That's the main thing. So. Nancy. That was my thank sister, you. Nancy. Oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I recognize the voice. That's why I thought it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Next, we're going to go to Sutapa Das. And Sutapa um, says that she came to the course five weeks ago to get a better understanding of her creative process, which is one of the things we do. We assess creativity and start to understand better where in the process we either fit or fight it. Um, but she comes away with a key learning about the, her own strengths and how her brain works and our renewed appreciation for self-kindness. This is what I really wanted to hit on. This idea of turning off that, that mean voice in your head and having enough self-kindness to maintain your vision and write your work. So a non-judgmental inner environment for my creativity. I'm, I'm a little jealous of that. I can't always achieve it. So we're gonna um, mute everybody and uh, turn it over to Sutapa Das with Wibbly Wobbly Girl. Uh, Sutapa, you have to yes. unmute yourself because I mute all that includes you. Oh. Um, am I am I mute or can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great.
So top it, you're muted for some reason. Can you unmute yourself? I can't unmute you. Okay, I guess I'll start again then. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You were muted okay. the whole time. I apologize. Oh, okay, okay. When I close my eyes, the first thing I see are her eyelashes, long, dark, and thick. She tilts her head, and I feel a tickle against the inside of my eyelids as her eyelashes brush against them. Her eyes come into focus just an inch away from mine, and we stare at each other intently. Her eyes are dark pools of nothingness, her expression blank. I don't know how she got inside me. I don't know whether she lives within my mind, my body, my brain, or in the space behind my eyes. Maybe she lives in another dimension that only I am privy to. I just realized I was muted again. So I don't, I don't know where, was I muted? You got to where only I was privy to. Correct. Okay, thanks. Her eyes are bigger than mine, and I imagine her trying to peer out, of the, out through the two small windows that are my eyes, out of the two small cage that is me. I don't know what she does, all day inside me. Sometimes I sense her moving around like an animal trapped in the cramped space, and I wonder if she's the reason for my bulges and soft spots, my aches and pains, my stretched out sagging skin. Does she lean against my shoulders and push out against my hips and belly, trying to extend out to her full size? I imagine her trying to turn over, trying to get comfortable inside her too small home, and I open my eyes just a little bit wider so that she may see out just a little bit better. I wonder sometimes if she would like to be free of me. Would she roam the wide open spaces, the deserts and prairies, the oceans and ice fields, breathing in all that emptiness? Would she sprint up mountains and glide down into valleys to celebrate her freedom? Do I hold her back from experiencing the world, my skin a barrier between multiple realities? Who would she be if I could let her go? But maybe she doesn't want to let go. Maybe she needs me to hold her up, to hold her together. Without me, would she be a wibbly wobbly girl, always on the verge of losing her balance? I open my eyes wide and look intently at my husband. What do you see? I ask him. He stares at me for a long moment and then says, I see you. Is that all? I ask, disappointed. At the coffee shop, I watch other people and I wonder if they too have an oversized, whipply wobbly person living inside of them. That night I dream. I have grown so large that the earth is a grain of sand beneath my big left toe. I bounce precariously, teetering and tottering, trying to stay grounded. I'm so focused with my mouth open wide in a determined grimace that on a particularly forceful exhale, she comes tumbling out of me. She's as big as me, and she spins around in a dizzying display of energy. I chase after her, and she leads me in a wild dance across the universe. We leap from star to star, playing the sky is not lava. We catch rides on comets, and we swing around galaxies. We squeeze into a black hole and shriek with delight as our features are distorted as it tries to compress us down to oblivion. We twirl through nebulae, bathe in red giants, and play hide and seek in the Milky Way. See, she seems to say. My world is not so small after all. Her laughter bubbles out of her and I can't help but smile because she's happier than I have ever seen her. At the end of the night, she leads me to the heart of her universe, a dark pool of nothingness where time stands still. I notice that her eyes are hazel like mine and I wonder if I have somehow flown into Wibbly Wobbly Girl and I'm looking at a reflection of myself. Are we like a pair of infinite nesting dolls, one within the other, within the other? In the shadows, she leans over to whisper her secrets, and I finally understand. In the morning, I lie in bed, trying to hold on to the fragments of my dream, trying to remember the secrets that she shared. I sense her inside me. As she turns her head, her eyelashes brush against my eyelids and brush away all remnants of my dream. I stare at her annoyed. 
He stares back with her dark, expressionless eyes, a defiant enigma. I throw off the covers and stomp into the bathroom, irked that she sees all my secrets and I know none of hers. I ignore her the rest of the morning as she recedes away from my consciousness. It's Saturday afternoon at the grocery store and there are too many people milling around prepping me with their cards. I try to navigate in between their sweaty bodies as they chat away on their phones, ignoring me. Cold air blasts out of the freezer section. Too cheerful, too loud, too grating music blares from speakers. High heel shoes click clack past, a squeaky cartwheel stalks me. A baby screams, a, stony, a snotty nosed toddler grabs an orange from the middle of a display, causing the whole pile to cascade down. Yelling, shouting, shrieking, laughter crowd in around me. The smell of samples, mini hot dogs, tomato sauce, tomato soup, frozen yogurt, cheese fills the air, turning my stomach. The floor starts, starts to undulate under me. I close my eyes to steady myself to escape inward before the world can crash in. I wait. But the emptiness stretches on inside me. Why doesn't she come? I brace myself for the onslaught as I open my eyes. I catch a glimpse of a shadow of a woman wearing a big floppy hat and a long glowing dress scurrying towards the exit. Is that her? Did I drive her away? I want to reach out to her to stop her, to explain, to understand. Instead, I grab the arm of the man browsing next to me. Did you see that woman? I ask. No. He looks startled, confused, unsure. Is she a friend of yours? His question echoes around in my head as he makes a hasty retreat to the end of the aisle. I lean over my cart and squeeze my eyes shut, trying not to panic. Is this how it ends? I can't move. I'm frozen to the floor, frozen to the cart. The hustle of bustle of life carries on around me, unaware. What will become of me without her living inside me? Will I deflate down to nothingness, a withered, empty ghost of a shell? Or maybe become a permanent fixture here between the tomatoes and zucchini? But then, I feel it, a familiar tickle of eyelashes against the inside of my eyelids. Her eyes come into view and I breathe a sigh of relief. And is that a hint of concern I see lurking within her expressionless eyes? I want to hug her, but I don't know how. Is she a friend of yours? I smile at her. Yes, I whisper. Yes, she is. That was really beautiful. Mm. That was amazing. Oh, that was so cool. Yeah. Lovely. Gorgeous. The imagery. So far, that was yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely beautiful. You know, she's my niece, and so <laughs> this is. I didn't know that she she has a lot of talents. I didn't realize what a wonderful. I mean, so insightful, Shutapa. I mean, it's like amazing, amazing. Your insightfulness, and you know is amazing and the and the emotion and sensitivity that went with it and your reading was unbelievable <laughs> so proud of you child so, so beautiful proud of you. thank you i agree i agree 100 percent. so taba i'm not in a place where i can use video right now i am so sorry this is karen i'm glad i could it. it was fabulous huh it was just wonderful it was very thank you the list what you've done to it since we've read since i got to read the beginning what you've done to it is amazing. The specificity <laughs> and the list. I love the list. It was a great addition. And the ending is perfect. Thank Thanks you. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for inviting me. From the title, Thanks I'm coming. interested in this. Wibbly Wobbly Girl, such a great title anyway. So now I'm uh, so interesting to find that that kind of fun name became such this deep yeah, girl, which is really interesting. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. So we're moving to Robin Gold. And Robin is a teacher. Um, high school English teacher and adjunct assistant professor um, and writing a YA novel called Don't Fly Too Close to the Sun. And that's what she's reading an excerpt of today. Um, the, the, it's a y, young, young adult novel featuring a, a protagonist with Crohn's disease, which is sometimes called the invisible disease. And so I'm going to leave it to Robin. Um, Robin, if you say something, you'll come into full view. Hello. Mm -hmm, there you go. And I will mute people. Okay, you know you. what? I will mute all, which will include you. So you have to unmute yourself, which is what was so clumsy with Sutapa. Okay. okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, hello. So like Julia said, I will be reading an excerpt from my YA novel called Don't Fly Too Close to the Sun, which features a protagonist with Crohn's disease. So, turns out, I really was a vampire and a witch. 
I had just been diagnosed with Crohn's disease a year ago and iron deficiency anemia soon after. And as soon as the doctor said Crohn's, my mind immediately went to Crohn's, C-R-O-N-E-S. And I thought, this is it. I'm becoming a witch. It's actually happening. Not that having Crohn's disease and actually being a Crohn or a witch are the same thing or even have anything to do with each other. Just like having Graves' disease doesn't automatically mean that you're going to die or come up from the earth in time for the zombie apocalypse for that matter, although that would have been equally awesome, I think. No, these diseases just tend to be named after whoever happened to discover them and nobody bothered to think about the puns or implications of these names until later, it seems. Thanks to Dr. Robert Burrell Frone and David Graves. So I came to the humanities freshman orientation with a moon face, which means that it was still puffy from the last round of steroids I'd been on, and my hair had been cut into these choppy layers to try to hide where it had come out unevenly or broke off as a side effect from the medications or result of the malabsorption and vitamin deficiencies that came with this disease. It wasn't exactly the way I'd envisioned myself walking into high school or the first impression I had been hoping to make, but I was just really happy to be going to school at a district and leaving all the drama from elementary and middle school behind me. As if being called vampire girl throughout elementary school wasn't enough, try being falsely accused of having an eating disorder and a drug problem in middle school. I blame the health teachers personally. See, we had these entire units dedicated to learning about anorexia, bulimia, STDs, shooting up heroin amongst other substances, but not a single unit dedicated to the natural differences that can emerge in people's bodies due to autoimmune diseases or other underlying health conditions. So after I began to lose weight uncontrollably, or ran to the bathroom after lunch every day, then stopped eating at school altogether to avoid getting sick before class. Rumors started to fly freely about my eating disorder until the Council of Middle School Girls with a Power Trip I used to sit with at lunch actually voted me off the lunch table survivor style for being a bad influence. The bruises didn't help my case either, nor did having to go to the nurse's office before lunch every day after I eventually got diagnosed take my drugs, which were actually prescription medications used to try to help my stomach digest the foods it couldn't break down naturally. But it took several months to even get to that point because even my own doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. At first they said it was a stomach virus, but stomach viruses don't last for five months usually. Then even they suggested that I could have an eating disorder, but I would have given anything to eat normally again without running to the bathroom or vomiting immediately after. By that point, I was down 30 pounds and my mom knew something was wrong, so she insisted on taking me to every doctor in the tri-state area until we finally got down to the bottom of things. After everything that happened, my parents and I were thrilled when I got my acceptance letter to attend school at district at the Scholar Center for the Humanities, which is how I ended up at the Humanities Freshman Orientation literally and figuratively entangled in a series of awkward icebreaker activities that included, but were not limited to, forming a human chain to play a version of Red Rover that was meant to symbolize breaking down the patriarchy, creating a human knot to represent all of us coming together in unity as a class, or sticking the names of famous philosophers from our summer reading list on our heads and walking around to ask, who am I? Until we were able to guess which philosopher we were eventually. But it wasn't until we were asked to lock eyes with someone across the room and sit with them to answer a series of questions about yourself this time, not Socrates, that I even noticed him. Although considering what he was wearing, I'm surprised I didn't see him sooner. His hair was longer than mine, but his texture very similar to my own, or at least what mine used to look like before getting sick. Thick, dark, and wavy. He had a burgundy bandana tied around his head Rambo style, and he wore a t-shirt with the sleeves ripped off. His jeans were a little too big on him and torn in places, but short enough to leave his ankles exposed below which his feet were bare. He must have taken off his shoes before the human non-activity to have greater flexibility in the game, right? I thought, searching the perimeter of the library for a pair of abandoned shoes tucked away under a chair or in the corner someplace. He couldn't have possibly come to the first day of high school without shoes, right? But he didn't look unkempt, and unlike some of our new classmates, he didn't look skinny, lanky, or awkward either. Altogether, he looked very sure of himself, and as such, his choice of wardrobe all looked very deliberate, so as to give him the appearance of having just walked off the set of an 80s movie. I bet he has good taste in music, I thought, as his eyes connected with mine and the line, but the moment that I first laid eyes on him from the Stevie Nicks song, Edge of 17, immediately popped into my head before I glanced down at his name tag and automatically assumed that I was reading it wrong, that the music in my mind must have somehow gotten cross-wired between my ears and my eyes, that the name scrawled across the tag in messy handwriting read Stephen, Stevie, Nicholas Johansson. Stevie Nicholas Johansson? You've got to be kidding me. He smiled as he made his way over. Hi, he said, extending his hand, which I noticed was calloused. I'm Stevie. I gulped, 
tried to speak, momentarily wondering if the swelling from my moon face had spread to my tongue or if I was suddenly in the middle of a savage spasm as the words just would not come out immediately. Rhiannon, I finally managed to say quietly, holding out my hand to shake his. His grin grew wider. Like the old Welsh witch Rhiannon, he said knowingly. So your parents also had a thing for Stevie Nicks, I replied, a bit more readily this time. I'd been named after her song Rhiannon, and he knew that already. He laughed, yeah, I guess you could say that. Mine too. He looked down the list of questions we'd been given to ask each other. In that moment, I was just really glad to have some sort of prompt. Otherwise, I don't think I would have known what to say at all. The question here says, if you were a mythological creature, which creature would you be, Stevie asked, reading off the paper. My mind went blank, the kind of blank that seemed to eradicate entire childhood just stained on tales of, from mythology and greco roman antiquity, Lord of the Rings, or the books of Anne Rice and Robin McKinley. But we already established that. You're a witch, right? I was all the more grateful for his prompting. In more ways than one, I finally managed to say, concerning the question while trying to avoid his gaze. A crone more specifically. But people have accused me of being a vampire, even a vampire witch. A blood magic witch. A blood magic witch, he repeated. I nodded. The thing is, though, these were all names other people had given me. None of these names were self-given, I said, taking the question seriously, thinking about the name calling, the teasing, the diagnoses from the past several years, all the labels other people have placed on me. How would I define myself if given the opportunity? What mythological creature would I be? But if I had to choose any creature right now, I said slowly, I would say that I would like to think of myself as a phoenix, rising up from the ashes of my experiences to become new again. He looked at me seriously, far too seriously for someone I only just met, someone who didn't even know me. What kinds of experiences, he asked, and suddenly I felt exposed, like I was some kind of ancient Egyptian tomb shut up tight inside, and he was an archaeologist trying to excavate me. The usual, I suppose, middle school drama, you know how that goes, right? I hedged, but I could tell from the look on his face he knew I was hiding something. After a moment, he said, well, we'll have four years together to talk about it, right? I nodded, just glad to change the subject. I didn't bother to say how much I really hoped to never think about middle school again, or how much I just wanted a fresh start, but I thought the phoenix metaphor got the point across nicely. What about you, I asked, what mythological creature would you be? He looked up, examining the tree mural painted on the ceiling of the library. A turtle, he said decisively after a moment of thought. A turtle, I repeated incredulously. Yeah, you can't be a turtle, I said, why not? It's not a mythological creature. So, he asked, I pointed back to the paper. The prompt clearly says, if you were a mythological creature, which creature would you be? And a turtle is not a mythological creature. He shook his head laughing. Rhiannon, we're in high school now. We get to make our own roles, write our own script. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm slow to get unmuted, but we can give that oh. a I agree. Well read. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Really got in down, Robin. Liked it. Yeah. She really, really captured that awkwardness, really, like many times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wonderful yeah. character writing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Is, aren't you loving hearing what people have been working on? I find myself yeah. just in awe of you all. And I'm so happy to have you, have had you every day without even knowing what gold we had. Ah, oh, Robin Gold, I made a pun. Ah. <laughs> okay. I like the puns part. <laughs> Thank you. Not actually my strength. <laughs> Anyway, okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for everybody um, so far. We're going to move on to Nazila Zamani. And Nazila is a somatic practitioner specializing in stress management and trauma. And she came to us not really with a book to write or any intention of writing, but just wanting to take advantage of the daily prompts and write for an hour because it was her effing hour. And she turned out to feel like it turned into a very nice and beautiful, um, supportive and wonderful thing that she got to do for herself these last five weeks, every weekday for an hour. She, followed, she wrote about the prompts and um, allowed her life to sort of rotate around that. So I'm going to put us in speaker view. And, Niz, and Nazila, remember, I'm going to mute everybody, which will include you, so you have to unmute yourself. If you'll talk to Zilla, you'll come to the center. Can you hear me? 
Hi, everyone. I'm just going to echo what Julia said. This is my uh, first reading, and I've never done this before. And um, I just joined because I needed a creative outlet during the COVID. Emma Agostina is in search of her true identity, striking out on her own to find her soul's intention. She sets off on a journey of self-discovery, sailing the ocean, not landing anywhere, rearranging her life, reevaluating her unfulfilled potential, trapped in cycle of self-sabotage, not knowing how to transcend into the new self-image, not knowing her values, and blindly choosing security and dependency over freedom was the trap in her way of wholeness. She feels she missed out in life, married at 18, lived a life of wifehood while possessing capacities beyond being a childbearing housewife. Maintaining cultural dependency, she became her own enforcer while upholding tradition, social and familial expectations. Being locked in, not knowing how to get over the hump, not going beyond parameters, was set form early on. From the outside experiences, she began to understand what's happening inside her. But when she asserted herself, she was faced with backlash. She slowly but surely began to wake up to the dysfunction. Repetition of the events are her new epiphany. She sets off on her journey of elimination of the past. A new point of change for a new direction opens up as she sees new possibilities. Now faced with her inner dichotomy, she gets a glimpse of her undeveloped selves, an uninhibited, adventurous, tender, vulnerable, innocent, sensual. Not knowing boundaries to a goal-oriented, pragmatic and practical Emma, her brain overamped, exhausted and depleted by trying to make everyone around her happy while trying to figure out her real self, she's unable to assimilate the new. The pendulum sways between fear and anxiety. Faced with fear of the unknown, she takes small acts of courage in spite of her fears and acceptance of her emotions. Emma gets in touch with her overflowing tears of sadness. She learns with each step that she need not give in to her fear. Thinking outside of the box, looking for new opportunities, learning new ways of being, evaluating her life experiences, forming her self-identity, exploring her own values, attitudes, and beliefs in depth, breaking old patterns, conditionings, limitations, and preconceived notions that had held her hostage for so long, understanding her culture, tradition, and what was expected of her, Emma finds a new sense of self and purpose, carving her own identity, her moral beliefs and self-value of her own apart from her family identity. She's faced with conflict between her self-identity and social identity of she's been socially defined and reshaped as a woman in her culture. What her discoveries reveal to her are her deep desire for freedom from limiting beliefs of her culture authenticity, and exploring her own truth. She didn't want to play a part in the familial and cultural dysfunctionality anymore. Freedom and divorce came in a package that was a dream too big to conceive of, yet she couldn't deny how her life had become tasteless and sour. She had reached a wall that seemed impossible to climb over, yet with her sense of frustration came an added sense of determination. She had no idea that her life was about to turn upside down, that the frightened, confused woman would never be the same again. Her change happened with awareness, acceptance, and a lot of courage. The transformation was like an inner volcano that started to erupt, and despite its danger and her own fear, she welcomed the release. The truths she accessed were the start of her healing, pointing the way toward looking deeper into her life. Transition that occurred gave her the ability to face disappointments and navigate failures. Get back up and just keep going, Emma. Her life experiences helped her world crack wide open, 
to leave her ideologies and notions at the door. This was the benchmark of true inner growth. She was relentless toward finding her truth, her own quest of self-discovery. Separating from her culture was a pivotal point for her, rejecting values that have been instilled in her. Spiritual work became the most important endeavor of Emma's life. Daring to be herself, rooted in her inner nature, stable and strong, cultivating herself and pure awareness became her greatest accomplishments and to be continued. What a great way to end that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah. Wonderful. Amazing. You are a writer. I yeah. know you tricked You're us. Definitely a writer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She was hiding oh, that writer. card. Yeah, she kept crying beginner, but that was great. That was. Yeah. Do well, you... she's got to leave that for me because. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. Fantastic. You more than earned it. That was great. Fantastic. Next, we have well Kathy Butterfield. And Kathy has a statement that, that starts out her bio that I'm just going to read word for word because it so comes from her. It so identifies her. I find congruence in images and words that meet in the intersection of imagination and reality. I'm a painter and a lifelong writer yet to be published. There's such drama and grit in that that I just wanted to share it word for word. Um, Kathy is going to read to us today uh, in something called a van full of me's m-e-e-s and kathy i'm going to mute everybody which means you have to unmute yourself okay um You're still muted. Let's see if I can unmute you. I'm not sure if I can or not. Let's we'll see. I'm opening my... There you go. No, nope. I'm unmuted. And I have to find my thing. And then I'm going to read because I'm kind of awkward here. But just hang on. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> what does a kid know about death? What does anybody know? Least of all a giggling five-year-old girl who was having the time of her life playing ball with her new grandpa, daddy's dad who drove all the way down from Idaho to see the family. She felt it was her he loved and her he wanted to see and her he comforted when the parents were screaming at each other or the earthquake came. Sitting in the redwood patio chair with wheels in the back, he bounced the big red ball to her. She bounced the ball to him. He killed over backwards, crash. His head hit the patio bricks. Her sister screamed. They called mommy, who got him to the porch steps before he collapsed again, leaving her holding him in her arms. La Pieta. Run, mommy said, go across the street. She did, and her sister did, and their noses pressed up against the window of the neighbor's front room as the ambulance drove him away forever. She wanted to put a tube down into the grave so he could breathe, so she could talk to him, but they didn't. Instead, they divorced a year or two later and told her to take care of her sister. She had a new mandate. Then she got another one. Be the messenger between mommy and daddy. She became the telephone. She had duties. She had to straighten up and fly right, so she did. She asked herself, what is my mission? She became what the role demanded. If there was shame, she hid it. If there was need, she filled it. If there was a problem, she solved it. A book, she read it. A challenge, she overcame it. She developed channels like a radio. She could turn the dial and hyper-focus on each role. She could remember and recite every word of the Lone Ranger radio broadcast. But she forgot about playing ball with her grandpa. The girl grew up with her channels the peacemaker, the dutiful, the smart one, the empath. 
When there was a problem, the aunts, cousins, uncles, or grandparents called on her to get on the phone and solve it. Why, she asked, why me? And Auntie told her flat out, why honey, every family needs a Yankee and we picked you. She read books about filial responsibility, nonviolence, relativity, comparative religion, and she did her duties. She thought of being a doctor, but father said women didn't do that. So she danced, she acted, she drew, she wrote, and she memorized and left herself when she entered a book, a play, a painting, or a movie. Her favorite thing, though, was driving. Driving away, far, far away on the two-lane highway, white lines, yellow lines, off into infinity. The azure blue sky in strong contrast with storm clouds of deep pain gray, illuminated in titanium white with pink blended by alizarin crimson. The windows rolled up, radio off, quiet, riding into the emptiness of the unknown destinations across the vacant west. The fields of yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and touches of greens and chromium yellow and orange. The landscape speeding past her, dogs in the back, created a peace and put distance between her and her obligations. Far away from the paints and canvases that sat unused, waiting for tomorrow when the chores were done, the business settled. Far from the stories that waited unwritten, snippets in cluttered drawers, the highway soothed her. She pulled onto a dirt road, stopped the van to let the dogs out, put her feet on the ground and breathed deeply the expanse around her while the dogs flushed out jackrabbits and ran after them. She loved being surrounded by emptiness and peace. Then they came. Thoughts, reflections, regrets, remorse, insights, memories, all the chatter, directives and static. Inhale, exhale, follow the out breath. They were there whenever she stopped. Thunder sounded, lightning struck, and the acrid smell of electricity and wet, hot road filled the air. She turned and saw them. The Mees. Do your chores, painter, responsible writer, straighten up and fly right, storyteller, inspiration, cleaner, teacher, burning daylight, caregiver, critic, realtor, sorrow, dancer, regret, actor, coach, and Yankee jumped into the back of her van, and the dogs got in with them. Inspiration yelled, shotgun, and sat beside her. Timid and remorse sat next to the painter and writer, and the others paired up and started talking to each other in the back. She drove, trying to dissuade them. She flew past decades marked by highway speed limits, hoping they would quiet down and she'd be alone on the highway with her dogs, driving into the strong contrasts and lines and vivid landscape. But they kept laughing, and she felt herself floating, not the out-of-body floating that follows trauma, but floating like a moat or a star in a fractal universe. Well, here we all are, she said. We should have a picnic and work this out. She pulled onto a forest road and stopped. The food appeared with a blanket, the watermelon and lemonade, the friendly shade tree beside the stream. The picnic began. She wondered if she should give a speech or issue instructions on how this meeting of the me's should go. But she thought, no, that's Yankee's job and she ain't me no more. Instead, she listened to Burning Daylight, talked to Dancer while Do Your Chores whispered into Painter's ear and Painter giggled. She watched and heard while the channel me's chatted in a cacophony of static and clear tones, all of them getting along as though there had never been any differences among them. Suddenly, they all broke into a rousing rendition of Teddy Bear's Picnic, and she joined them. When you go out in the woods today, everyone rolled on the ground laughing and jumped up and down like kangaroos and shouted at the sky while the dogs howled. Towards evening, they all climbed back into the van, and she drove across the Technicolor landscape, with each mile getting more vivid and brilliant as the red ball sun sat on the horizon throwing god rays across the shocking pink clouds. Night fell, the moon rose. She was focused on the white line when she saw the ancestors rise from the mist of the earth in this moon bright night. She opened the window and breathed the night air to rouse herself. They flew into the van and nestled among the channel knees and the dogs all quiet in slumberland. She heard her forebears whisper, you tell her. No, you tell her. 
Then in one soft, gentle voice, they whispered in unison, there is only love. Everyone is doing the best they know how on this earth. Let it go, you're not to blame. It was our time. Tears rolled from her eyes and her heart broke open from the joy of forgiveness and love while the other slept in the land of dreams, visions, and parallel universes. The dawn came, the moon sank, the red ball rose. She inhaled the fresh morning air. She exhaled, knowing that in the night, all the me's faded first into static, then into silence, merging into only one. The dead abide with the dead, the living with the living, when called upon, pass through the veil to meet. While the dogs danced, she walked inside with inspiration to paint highways, visions, and memories with vivid words, colors, contrast, and brilliance. Wow. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Good, good, yeah. good. You're a painter, oh. like unbelievably vivid imagery. Yeah. So real. Beautiful. Thanks, everyone. Very Good moving. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And beautiful yeah. reading. Thanks. <laughs> Threw me right in. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> well, especially as family. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's right. But, uh, but uh, regard, I mean, it was beautiful to step out of that role, too, and go, wait, this is. The story that you've written it's it's not um and release kind of any attachment to where that goes or what that's supposed to be it was it was really beautiful to listen to that's actually a lovely testament when you yeah. as someone who knows her well can take it completely out of context and just hear it it's like if you can watch something on a stage and you see them in character it's a great testament yeah. to that mm -hmm. not relatable just to me it's relatable yeah, it was. Really? Yeah. Yeah, to anyone. Yeah. We just, we just, the family just sees it more intently. Precisely. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But it's lovely that we, it was, in, it's intensely relatable to all. Oh, yeah. We all have many channels and roles and that stress and that fear and, you know, all those things that you described. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Me, 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 me. <laughs> and you sang and talked about kangaroo, so full circle. <laughs> <laughs> I noted that. Well done, Catherine. Well done. It was really Thank good. Thank you so much, everyone. Yes. Okay, we're going to move on to Martha Rand. Uh, Martha, typically this time of year, is working at a Renaissance fair for the past whatever. Two, 20 years or something along those lines uh, as an astrologer and massage um, therapist. And she also is a social worker at school. And of course, that's not really gearing up yet either. So she happened to, in her busy life, squeeze us into these five weeks and write with us. Um, what she's reading tonight actually was already included in an anthology called Tallish, published by Pure Slush, Volume 11 by Matt Potter. So I'm going to give it over. It's called Spirit Week. I'm going to give it over to Martha. I will be um, muting everybody, Martha, and you unmute yourself. Wait, I'm not. I'm, okay, there we go. Okay. Okay, so I'm not, I'm off mute now. Good. Okay. So a little introduction to this first piece. When I thought about becoming a school social worker 18 years ago, I called the School Social Work Professional Organization and I did some reading to try to find out what school social workers did as I transitioned from clinical social work to school social work. And everybody I talked to told me, it all depends. It depends on the building you work in, the principal who supervises you, the child study team with whom you work. Pretty broad advice. I thought I would like to create a book drawn from real life incidents and create fictionalized accounts of what I've actually done or been asked to do. So here is an example of what a school social worker does with a very angry young student 
in order to help support students learning their own social emotional skills. Spirit Week, the basketball tournament in the middle school. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. It was early in the morning and the school social worker was listening to the frequent refrain of her 11 year old counselee. You're right, sweetie. There's a lot about life that's not fair. You don't understand. I have all the short players on my team. The young girl stamped her feet. It's not fair. There was no point in interrupting too soon. The young girl would have to wear herself out a little before she could hear the school social worker's response. Besides, it was true. Most of the sixth graders were not as tall as the seventh and eighth graders. And in spirit week, the tournaments were grade against grade. When life isn't fair, sweetie, we all have to reach inside ourselves and find the best way to respond. That's how we develop inner strength and the ability to do our best in the face of what we're dealt. The young girl leaned forward in the comfy red chair across from the desk, arms wrapped around her stomach and bared her teeth. You're a good player. I've watched you at recess. When you play basketball, I can see that you're thinking. You're strategizing how to make the shots. The 11 year old gazed up to make eye contact with the social worker. Her mouth softened and she shook her head as she whistled out of breath. Go out there today, play your best game, be a great player. Maybe you can even be a generous player and make the rest of your team look good. That's what a great player does. They play their best game and they make the rest of their team look good at the same time. The social worker paused. I think you can do that. The young girl stood up, still angry. She left the room to return to class. The tournament took place that day during the long recess that combined lunch and gym. The sixth grade came in second. The seventh grade came in first. The eighth grade and the faculty team came in third and fourth. During end of day homeroom, the social worker and the young girl sat in the same chairs they had sat in earlier that day. Your team did a good job. You came in second. You guys worked well together. What do you have to say for yourself now? The 11 year old paused, thought hard. Maybe I should have more faith in my friends. This morning you accepted that you weren't going to get your way. You played your best. You demonstrated good teamwork and the social worker paused. You were willing to reconsider your behavior. Good job today. The end. Very good. Okay. I was rooting for her. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Great, Martha. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. That was really fun. <laughs> really so that's what you do all day. <laughs> <laughs> you talk children into being their better selves. I tried. That was very real. That was nice. Very real. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Okay, we're going to go to Joanne Scalf. Joanne considers herself a novice writer, um, but she has a story that she's burning to tell. 
about a multi-generational area of chemical spill, chemical what? Um, you know, did, exposure. Exposure. Uh, yeah. Um, and then and then she's created this voluntary health map by talking to some four hundred people about what the outcomes of these of this chemical exposure has been over the past forty years. So that's the story she's burning to tell. It's something on a par with Silkwood. She's going to stand on a desk and make sure we all get it. Um, but today <laughs> she's reading something lighter than that, which comes uh, from one of our prompts. And it's, I'm going to mess up the name because I don't think I wrote it down right. But Mrs. Buffanani and the Prom Queen, but you say it right. This is Joanne's. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's Miss Buffanani Grandam Steals the Prom Show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, you unmute yourself, okay? All right. All right, did that work? Can I get a thumbs up? Y'all can hear me? Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? <laughs> um, so, yes, as she, um, as uh, Julia had mentioned, this is not about my story, so to speak. It's trying to figure out how to write uh, first off before I can figure out how to piece uh, something together so I could communicate not those stories specifically because they have trusted me not to share their story, um, but just to communicate what a community might go through over decades of uh, chemical exposure and generations of um, health problems. So this is from a prompt from one of our stories. Um, so, Miss Buffanani Grandam steals the prom show. Allie enters the shop, duffel bag in hand, shouts, hey, Boof, waving toward the antique dress form in the display window as she almost barrels into an exiting customer. Oh, pardon me, ma'am, as the customer turns up her nose. Allie Sargent, get out of that hideous getup before Millie hears about it. Why? Allie sings, Boof won't tell. Besides, I like this getup. It's how I roll. It might be how you roll, but it sure as hell ain't how you work here. And it sure as shit ain't how Melly runs her shop. As Allie glides towards Donna, Donna's face contorts, wrinkles and twitches until a side frown, furrowed brow and squinty eyes reside. Good God, Allie. Did someone crawl in your pocket and die? Go on, take this with you. Reaching for a can under the cashier's counter, she hands it to Allie during her pass. Before you come out of there, you spray that bag with this until it melts, dripping with Lysol, you hear? As Allie changes, they chat about Allie's work at the chicken hatchery. Allie's glad that after her physical transformation into shop digs, the conversation transforms as well. George is coming after work from Helsicon. He said he had something to chat about, Allie remarks. George enters. Taking the cue, Donna steps out, and puffs on her cigarette until George exits in a rush. Donna returns. They lock eyes. What? Um, he, he asked me to the prom. He asked me to the damn prom. Donna blurts, tomorrow? Allie answers, too stinking morrow. <laughs> Allie has said yes, after for a, a long, warm, congratulatory embrace. So you're going to wash that get up before tomorrow night, right? fully implying that Allie would wear the chicken hatchery work clothes to the prom. They both giggle as Allie admits she has nothing to wear. Millie has arranged a contingency. Donna proclaims. Allie looks at Donna and cocks her head to the side like a confused puppy. What? What does that mean? Well, expecting this invite sooner, Millie told me that if you got invited to the prom, then you were going to wear Miss Booth. No if, ands, or buts. She absolutely, positively insists. I can't, I, I just can't. I simply, absolutely, positively just can't, Allie exclaims in a panic. Oh yes, you can, and oh yes, you will. Millie loves you like her own. Enjoy your prom, Donna demands in a stern but loving tone. Later that evening, Earl and Trudy drive by the shop on their regular late night hoagie run. Oh my heavens, Earl, Miss Boop is missing. Trudy exclaims as Earl rapid fire replies the question, Miss Booth, missing? Trudy adds, that dress form was as naked as a jaybird, I kid you not. 
are we talking about the Miss Booth and Annie Grandam 1933 Charles James Lilac Evening Gown? Yepers, same Miss Booth. Turn around, girl, Trudy directs. Same Miss Booth that gets police drive by three times a night to make sure she's safe and secure. Same Booth on the billboard north of town. Same Booth who has a twin sister, not identical, but fraternal. Cream colored twin in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Yep, same Booth. As he turns the car around in the middle of the intersection, is she sold? No, no way. What, Wh where in tarnation could she be? Earl steers the car back round to the shop, sees for himself, then hightails it over to the police station. There, the pair are informed that Miss Booth has been invited to the prom and that she has accepted the invitation. Constantly scanning with eyes and ears like antenna, Janessa, George's mom, paces back and forth from front door to parlor window, periodically peering out, looking for Allie, no doubt. Listening sharp, she trains on that familiar smooth hum of Allie's car. Walking out the window, she spies a curious sight as George's date has arrived to fetch him. Officer Truman, so close behind, he could be in tow. Oh my stars, Janessa turns to her head towards the stairs and calls out to George, you guys have a police escort. At this revelation, she rushes to the hall closet, grabs her antique, antique full length mink coat, holds it at the ready and stares back at the stairs. She turns back after she hears the car door close and glimpses Miss Booth heading up the stairs. George has made his way down the stairs. For only a moment, they share a warm greeting. She holds the coat in outstretched arm, motions for him to take it. Eyes trained on him, she reaches out with her one arm to open the door. He takes the coat and turns to face Allie as Allie steps in. George and Allie smile at each other, wave by to mom, then head out the door and down the steps. George exclaims, oh shoot, I forgot. He pivots with a quick step, rushes in just enough to retrieve the boutonniere and corsage that are perched on the entry table. Bounding down the concrete steps together in quick strides, he overtakes her and as they reach the sidewalk, he then trots across the verge and in front of the car to arrive to open the driver's side door for her. With the fur coat in hand, he places it over the driver's seat and he fixes it and arranges it so that it is the perfect nest. And he exclaims, voila, only the best for Booth. She replies knowingly, is this Miss Booth insurance policy per mom? George says, why yes. She says, I like it, nestling herself in. Closing Allie's door, he turns to Officer Truman, who has been watching them intently. He earns a nod of approval and a nice touch. George odds, nods back, points to mom as the instigator of Miss Booth's insurance policy underwriting. Still pointing at mom, he rounds the car, gets into the passenger seat. George looks at mom, still observing from the picture window. He nods, smiles, and she blows a kiss. Both Allie and George look at each other. Allie begins to start the ignition as George's eyes stay fixed on her. She turns the key. Let's get this old bird to her first prom. Yeah, Miss Booth. Front page news once again tomorrow. And I was afraid the evening might be awkward. Both laugh. He says, no, really, Allie, you look great. Allie replies, what? This get it? That's how I roll. Miss Booth goes down in St. Charles history with one more accolade, the ultimate relationship icebreaker. And scene. <laughs> nice, lovely. I love that Miss Booth and Annie is the best. Yeah. <laughs> the best name. Mm -hmm. Not at all what I expected. Yeah, yeah. oh my gosh. <laughs> I love the character as a, the dress as a character. Yeah. That, that's what I was trying to do. I was I was trying to set it so that the dress could be a character because in most of my story, what I'm going to try to do is have the setting be a character. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It worked. Very clever. Yeah. So that's a very good original. Well done. Yeah, very original. Yeah. Very, very descriptive. Right. Oh, so very nice. Thank you for sharing that. We now go to our last reader tonight, and I got to say, this has been like, so far, seven little movies, which is really fun. Um, so Nanette is 
is a visual artist primarily, and she looked forward to this class in order to sort of organize all of her creative writing um, for the first time in a long time. And as she says, ha! And she is going to share with us something that she's been researching a long time, which is how to shut up the inner voice. Am I getting that right? Yes. And um, it's called, thank you for coming, now go away. And I have a feeling we all need this particular, <laughs> this particular seven minutes is going to be important for all of us, I'm pretty sure. So um, here we go, I mute, you unmute, and off we are to the races. Have you ever been stuck in a rut? The harder you try to get out of it, the deeper you get stuck. You get a good handhold and a good foothold. You pull yourself up, then you do it again. Then you hear this voice come from out of nowhere. You know, you'd be a lot more successful if you'd just get out of your own way. What? <laughs> Down you go. You're like, where did that voice come from? And what does that even mean? That's not helpful. So what do you do? That voice, my friend, is the sound of your inner critic. We all have one. It's part of the human condition. What is it and where does it come from? Brene Brown is a groundbreaking researcher, author, and speaker. She says love and belonging are irreducible human needs. We all want to feel loved and protected. Our brains are wired that way to protect us. As children, we listened and paid close attention to the adults in our tribe so we could learn how to behave in order to survive. If we encountered a threat, our brains would remember that and try to help us avoid it in the future. Neurons store this information in our long-term memory and your inner critic reminds you with good intentions, uh-oh, you're gonna get hurt. It's a psychological response causing us to go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. After a while, these criticisms and judgments become so deeply ingrained that we no longer recognize them as messages that came from outside our own minds. We believe these critical messages to be our own truths. Oftentimes, the well-meaning criticisms from the past are internalized, and we don't even realize we're talking to ourselves in such a way because it seems normal. Pretty soon, we stop taking risks. The only problem with that is if you want to bring something new and creative into this world, you have to be able to take risks. The inner critic and creativity cannot exist in the same space at the same time. So what do you do? The absolute very first step is to not beat yourself up for having inner critical thoughts. There's nothing wrong with you for having an inner critic. It's part of the human condition. Remember, the inner critic is a mental protection response we all have. None of us ask for those situations in which some scathing criticism came out of nowhere. None of us consciously chose to take on the fears and mistaken beliefs of the people we look up to. Seriously, do not beat yourself up. There is no need to be self-critical about being self-critical. The next step is to define your own inner critic name it. Give it a story. Draw a picture of it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it out of your head. The point is to get it out into the open, get it out of your head, so you can get perspective on this thing that is controlling your life. Is it male? Is it female? Is it an authority figure? Is it a bully? Is it a ridiculously repetitive tyrant? Once you've identified your inner critic, you can use some tap tactics to help manage it better. Denise Jacob, in her book, Banish the Inner Critic, suggests a few things, and one of them is to remember the acronym SHIFT. Now, I'm a very visual person. I'm gonna give you some visual, some visual cues. So I just broke my S, but this is an S. Can y'all see it? Okay. Hopefully it's not backwards. So S stands for stay present. And I made a little note here so I could remember. 
All right, so stay present. Take several deep breaths to get yourself grounded and back into your body. H, have compassion. By understanding that you're feeling scared, commit to give yourself comforting messages. There's an I. I stands for invoke mindfulness by realizing that you are not your thoughts and that you have the power to observe them without reacting to them. F, focus your attention. Choose to place your attention on alternative thoughts. And T, trust yourself, knowing that the creative part of you exists and it will come out when you relax and get creative. Once you've gotten to know your inner critic a little better, talk to it with compassion. Say to your inner critic, I appreciate you trying to keep me safe and I thank you. However, you are not needed right now. I'm gonna do this thing anyway and learn what I need to learn from the process. We can break and replace the obsolete thought patterns with new, more supportive ones with neuroplasticity, the ability to create new connections between nerve cells in response to change. Catch yourself in the midst of a negative thought and say, just a minute, inner critic, I'll be with you later. If it gets a little enthusiastic, try to quiet it down, retrain your brain, take back control, and show the inner critic who's boss. The next thing you can do is to make a gesture signaling your inner critic to stop bothering you and go away. One of the tricks in the book describes how swiping left is a natural response and a very effective way to stop a negative thought in its tracks, much like swiping an app on a phone or erasing an email. Once you've caught it, reframe it and move forward. The inner critic needs to vamos, skidal, go bye bye. If you are a fan of Brene Brown, you're familiar with rumbling. Over the weekend, I rumbled with the thought of my inner critic. After a long session of rumbling about my own inner critic, I named him Buster, as in the fun buster. Think of Yosemite Sam with his big mustache and his fiery hot temper. He's not nice. Now think of the extremely disapproving face of Grumpy Cat and put the two together. Yes, my inner critic looks a lot like a cross between Yosemite Sam and Grumpy Cat. He is the rootness tootness inner critic the side of the Midwest. Once I drew a picture of him, he didn't seem so big or scary anymore. In fact, he looked quite ridiculous and small. To sum up the process, step one is to acknowledge your inner critic. Step two is to remember the acronym SHIFT. Talk to him with compassion if possible. Thank you for your feedback, now please go away. And step three is to swipe left. One other thing you can do with your inner critic is once you've drawn a picture, you can tear it up. There, now we can all get back to being creative. Back to you, Julia. Oh, like a Today Show ending. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. I think everybody on this call needs that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I love our critics. And I love shift. Shift. Yes. Easy. I love that was fantastic. Of Yosemite Sam and Grumpy Cat. Yeah. You should have told that in the beginning. Of Can the I part. share my screen? Is that possible to share? Share? Oh, oh share drawing? Sure. Yeah. Was that what you said? Yeah, I was gonna see if I could pull it up, um, but I'm not sure if you have it. Sure uh, I don't know if you can share screen, but try. All right, let's see if I can get it to come up. I just had it here on my. I, don't know I was what gonna. For. I was gonna print it out, but I'm, you know, I'm an artist. So I don't think that far ahead. Mm -hmm. kind of <laughs> Fortunately, I never make that kind of mistake. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if you can share screen or not. I just don't know what the settings are on this particular meeting. It's a mm -hmm. higher security meeting. It might not let you, but just try. If you can, I'm happy to have you do it. All right, let's see. I've got, here it is. Oh, there you go. 
Can you see it? There. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Buster. That is good. <laughs> very good. Uh, I can't, I was not in a, you know, very good frame of mind when I did this, so it's not my best work, but now you get great. To... No, this is <laughs> <Point> amazing. <laughs> that is fantastic. Great. Uh, put that on a dartboard. <laughs> <laughs> you can, with your inner critic, you can draw it, and then you can crumple it up, and you can burn it, and it's mm. so amazing. <laughs> okay. So how, well, do I, like how, how do I, with... I undo, okay. un Julia? How do I unshare? Um, so what I'd like to do right now is ask the readers to stay behind a minute so we can, first of all, read some of the chats because I think some of us haven't had a chance to do that. Yeah, if you want to unshare your screen, that would be good. How do you do that? Um, same, click, click the the same share button. Button. Okay. Say, stop sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay, got it. No problem. Okay. Just buster to go away. <laughs> <laughs> Wipe left. <laughs> So I'm going to ask the um, readers to stay, uh, stay behind. We really appreciate the warmth and the participation of everybody who came. And just even that there were so many of you to support us was just a, it just is what makes the world good. I'm so glad you're all here and thank you for coming.